I like to do a good job. And I think most people like to do a good job too. And I don't always do a good job. In, in fact, in the next 25 minutes, I'll probably slip up once or twice. Um, but I think I get a sense of satisfaction or contentment when I do a good job, when I achieve something that I've set out to do. And I think the same goes for most people. I think it gives us a sense of job satisfaction, which gives us a, self -a, sen a sense of self-esteem, which in turn can probably make us happier at our jobs. But it's not always easy to know that you've done a good job. Sometimes the results of your efforts are invisible and locked inside the head of a teenager. And that can be very difficult for us to measure. And that's one of our problems as middle school and high school teachers. I came to Korea first in 2006, and although I took a couple of years off to go and study in Australia, and Seifel is the fourth school that I've worked at. And my first year I worked at a Hagwon, and for the 12 months I was there, the only feedback I ever really got was a smile every day from the Hagwon owner. So I guess I was doing an okay job, and she kept on paying me, so it must have been it must have been okay, but that was pretty much the only feedback I got. My second year, I worked in the elementary school, um, and the kids were great, they were cute, they were fun. My co-teachers were very, very talented. But I found it hard for me to gauge how I was doing as a teacher, whether I was doing a good job or not. Um, but the third school I went to, it all changed. Um, and during my year at the, at the middle school in Songnam, um, me and my co-teachers developed a way that we could measure tangibly our effectiveness as teachers. And it's not rocket science, it's not very difficult, but very quickly um, it allowed us to measure how we were doing our effectiveness as teachers. And not only did it help us with that, but it also increased our job satisfaction. Yeah. So, this, this method I would like to share with you this evening, so hopefully it can give you a sense of increased job satisfaction too. Um, in your booklets, um, on page 14, there's a blank page. And if you have any questions or comments, um, I'd like you to maybe jot them down, because I'd really like to talk about this at the end. 20 minutes is kind of a short time to talk about this idea, so if you have any questions, we have five minutes at the end to maybe discuss it and tailor it to your school. <clears throat> so, my objectives tonight, um, First one is to demonstrate how assessment can help teachers succeed. Um, the focus that we will have tonight is on interim, interim assessment for you, not for your students. This is assessment so that you can tell that you are doing a good job and you can assess how well your teaching strategies are doing. Also, I'd like to introduce a framework of a no-stress test. Um, usually. We avoid doing tests for lots of different reasons, but I don't think that needs to be the case, and I want to introduce a framework that we can work with. I'd like to present an example of this model, one which I've used in the middle school, and I'd also like to make you laugh a little bit, or at least smile. Okay, it's already worked a little bit. Excellent. <clears throat> Good. So, to make you laugh, um, I'm going to do a little bit of research. Not only do I like assessment, um, but I also like puns. Now, I admit that not everybody thinks puns are very funny. Some people have described them as the lowest forms of wit. Um, but I like puns. And I think um, they can be very interesting. And I would like to be the punniest person in the world. And tonight, I would like you to help me. Um, so, we're going to do a little bit of an experiment. My objective in this experiment is simply to entertain you. Um, I'm going to show you a pun, and I would like to gauge your reaction to that pun. Also, during the assessment section, I would just like you to be honest. You're going to be asked a number of questions and to raise your hand to gauge your reaction, and all I would ask for you is that you are honest. Okay? Now, to remove any kind of researcher bias, while you look at the puns, I am going to be wearing a blindfold, and I'm going to wear earphones. And in order to do this, I'm going to ask two of my colleagues, Alicia and Raquel, to come to the stage and help me out. So please give them a warm up.
Everybody looks so happy. You enjoyed my pun? It's really, really good, isn't it? So I think I'm going to continue with this style of pun because if I want to be the punniest guy in the world, this is a really nice. <coughs> what? It didn't work? No. no. Three what? laughs. Three no. laughs in this whole room? Horrible. Okay. Okay, hold on. Ah, uh, hold on. I, I think I know why this doesn't work. Because for this to work, you go ba na na na. So it's physical. And there's sound involved. So when you saw it on the screen, you lost the joke. Okay, I see. It didn't work. Okay, I've got another one. I want to try one more. I'm going to take away the action, take away the sound. Okay. Good. Okay. Back in the Okay, that was much better, yeah? Did I get them all this time? Every single person laughed or smiled? Everybody would share it? Just a few more laughs? Nobody, nobody wanted to never hear this one again, I'm sure. It's really fun. Okay, really? No? Not good? What can I do? Let me, let me check out the audience. Okay. Many of you are alive when Confucius was around. Probably not many. Okay, so we need to make it more modern. Maybe more... Technological, maybe more visual. Okay. I really hope that one worked. 
Much better because that's all I got. That's pretty much the funniest pun I've ever seen. <coughs> One big laugh and laugh. Excellent. Okay, ladies, thank you very much. Please give them another round of applause. I couldn't do this very important research if it wasn't for you guys. Thank you very much. Okay, so that, in a nutshell, is the assessment that I would like to talk about. It is the driving force for improvement. It highlights your success and it also uncovers areas that you can work better at. Um, so, <clears throat> recently, uh, Bill Gates gave a TED Talk, um, which maybe some of you would have seen, and it was entitled, Teachers Need Real Feedback. Um, it was focused on teachers in America, um, but one of the things, one of his points that he made was that until recently, most teachers in America got a single word of feedback. One word, only one word. Would anybody like to guess what that might be? Yes. 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 No. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. But they were given feedback from their principals or their vice principals or the head of their department. A single word of feedback. <clears throat> Excellent. That would be very nice. If that was true, that would be a very nice way. The actual word. Oh, yes. Satisfactory. Excellent. I have no chocolate. That, that was excellent feedback the satisfactory answer. Very good. <clears throat> and so what does this word tell us? Very little. It was the same as the director smiling at me in the morning or paying the paycheck at the end of the month. And there's really very little information in this word. And there's very little challenge and there's very little opportunity to grow. So as feedback, I think this word itself is unsatisfactory. But why is assessment so important then? Why did Bill Gates want to tell us that teachers need more real feedback? Well, there's a lot we can learn from feedback. Because teaching is a cause and effect relationship. And for different teachers, there's a different effect you're trying to cause. Maybe you want your student to be fitter if you're a PE teacher. Or maybe you want your students to be more creative if you're an art teacher. But for us, we want to increase their level of English. Um, for some professions, it's very easy to judge what the result of your actions are. Um, painters, they have a painting at the end of, of, their, of their work. Uh, chefs, they cook. And maybe while they're cooking, they test and they add some salt or they add some spices. Um, maybe even football players. Soccer players can look back on their performance and assess it. It's very difficult for us as teachers to do that. But... Assessment fills that gap for us. It acts as an effective feedback loop so that we can reflect on what we have done and hone our skills as teachers. <clears throat> so if it's so important, why don't we do more of it? Um, there's a few very solid reasons why we don't do more assessment. Um, the first is the time involved. Um, it takes a lot of time to make an assessment and it takes even more time to correct it. And so that's why usually exams are done nationally or even provincially. There's a responsibility on the teachers. You have to be very careful when you make a test to make sure that it, what the students have been taught, they have been challenged in that test, that they know what the answers would be. And especially in Korea, there's a lot of pressure on students. Some students want to get 100% in every single test. Um, the significance of the results is also important. If you're going to put all this time and effort into it, and the students are going to study, filing the results in your filing cabinet and never looking at them again is not enough. Um, tests can be very boring for both teacher and student too. Um, and finally, tests are a little bit scary, especially if you're testing yourself. Um, I wasn't too sure about getting you to assess my puns, maybe I'm glad I couldn't see or hear your reactions. Um, but it can be a little bit scary to test your own effectiveness and whether you're doing a good job. But I don't think that these are necessary characteristics of assessment. These are not the things that make an assessment what it is. What if we changed it a little bit? What if instead of an assessment taking lots of time, it was very quick, it was easy for you to organize and it was easy for the students to take? What if instead of there being a responsibility on you, your assessment was for personal growth, to point out areas to you that you were succeeding in and uncover areas that you could improve on? Instead of pressure on students, imagine it was a straightforward structure. 
that they were able to become familiar with. And over time, if you did interim assessments at the end of every chapter, they knew exactly what was in store. Instead of insignificant, they could be easily recordable and that you could look back over them over a certain amount of time. Instead of boring, they were fun. They used multi-intelligent perspectives instead of only just the linguistic areas. And instead of being a little scary, they were tailored to suit your individual situation. Now, so far what we've been talking about um, is the framework. But the only way this framework is going to work is if it's specifically made and tailored for your individual situation. So when you're making your own assessment, the first thing you have to think about is what is your role in school? Um, and this can be done as an individual or maybe you and your co-teacher together can talk about what are you looking to achieve in your classroom. Um, for some people, you'll be trying to make English more interesting. You'll just be trying to make it more fun, more inviting for the students. And um, so if you're going to do that, maybe your assessment is going to be different than if you were looking solely at vocabulary or grammar. That would be a different role. So it's up to you to decide what are your roles. Once you've decided what your roles are in the school, then it's time to figure out what is the measurement of success in that area. If it is to make English more fun, maybe your, assess or your measurement is going to be about how many students are smiling in my class, or how interested they seem when they're doing a task. If your role in your school is for conversation practice with your students, maybe your measurement is going to be how many times do students come to my class during lunchtime to have a conversation with me? How many children say hello to me in the corridor? Um, or if it's just to do with grammar and vocabulary, maybe your measurement is going to be a written test and you can assess that then one by one. Um, the correction can be one of the most difficult parts when it comes to assessment. Um, if, you're, if your class is maybe 35 or 40 students, a single class you're going to have a pile that high of assessments. If you multiply that by maybe the 10 or 12 classes that you have, Within a week, you might have a pile this high. And um, so I would suggest getting the students to correct the tests. And um, Jonathan's going to talk a little bit later about peer evaluation. And I think it lends itself very well to this form of assessment. Remember, this assessment is for you, not for the students. So the students don't need to write their names on the top. And if you can collect them and very quickly mix them up and send them back out to the students, then they can review the answers at the same time and they don't know whose test they correct. And finally, correlation. This can be a little bit difficult, but it's important that you can look for trends. That's what you're looking for here. You're looking for times when you performed well. And if there are times when you didn't, then you can look back on what you did that time to try and improve it in the future. And when I did this in the middle school, for the entire year I had a single page. That was the correlation of the results for the classes. And I want to give you a look at that now. Oh, before we do, we'll have a look at the test itself. Um, in the books on page 12, maybe you can't see it from back there, but here's an example of what the test would look like. This is taken from a specific middle school book in the chapter, it's Lesson 6, Songs of Hope. Um, but if you look at the test, it's a 10 question test. The first test to introduce a bit of music into it, you could play a song, and the question is, listen to the music and write the next line. Now, this may be a song that you've played in class before or that the students are familiar with. And the second question is a simple fill-in-the-blank exercise. Third question is a reading exercise with two questions. The fourth one is to put an X over Kenya on the map, so something visual. And the fifth one, to rearrange the letters to make the continents. And then on to page 13, make a short four-line poem using these as the first letters. A vocabulary question in seven um, matches the word and its meaning. Um, in eight, it introduces a bit of social interaction. So you're supposed to turn to the person beside you and ask them where they would like to visit. Uh, nine is which country would you like to visit and why? And then ten brings in a little bit of TPR, a bit of kinesthetic learning. So it says, well done, you're almost finished. Now place this paper in the red basket on the teacher's desk and sit back down again. So they have to follow instructions for this. Not everybody's test would say red basket. On the, on the desk I used to have a green basket, a blue basket, a red basket, and a yellow basket. So when I sent the papers out again, I knew I wasn't giving them to the same table. 
each table was color coordinated. So the students would then mark these tests and they would put a total score down here in the bottom. So when I collected the tests, all I had to do was very quickly flick through them and then I could take an average of those scores. So here's what the page would look like um, at the end of the semester, at the end of the year. These were the lessons on the left, so first one, two, three, and on the top then were the classes. So grade one, grade two, and grade three. So I would just tally the scores, get an average, and that was the one result I put in there for that lesson. And so if you have a look, you see maybe at the, at the beginning they were a little bit lower. Some classes were better than others. But you can kind of see in week three that things started to improve a little bit. Maybe because the students were getting used to the form of assessment. Um, maybe because we were looking at what we were doing and becoming better teachers. Um, but then, if you look down, also in week five, they started to get a bit lower. So you'd have to look at that then. Maybe the game that you were using that week didn't make a lot of sense. Or maybe the song was too difficult. Or there was some aspect of it. And if there is an aspect like that, that it looks like there's a dip in, you can then go back one by one through the, through the test and have a look and see if it's a pattern. Okay, so let's review all of our all. Um, assessment has a bit of a bad reputation, I think, both from uh, students' perspectives and teachers. Um, but I, I really think it's the only way to gauge your effectiveness. It's the only way to find out if you are doing a good job or not. And as we've seen, there are approaches that we can use to make it work for both you and your students. Oh, but the most important thing when you come to making an assessment, is it needs a catchy acronym. Nothing, nothing in education, specifically or in Korea too, is going to work without a catchy acronym. So if you're going to make an assessment and you want it to work, you need to find one. You know the NEAT test? You know what NEAT stands for? It's a pretty neat name, but what it stands for is a little bit more boring. It's the National English Ability Test. So, just to give you a few examples, when you make your assessment, you're going to need to make some catchy acronyms. And here's some ideas for you. Anybody have any idea what the cool assessment might be about? It's a bit difficult. <laughs> it's essentially organized overseas language test. Maybe you could call it that. It sounds really impressive, but it's maybe only two pages that you do every month or so. How about the K-pop test? Now, your kids would love this. If you walked into your class and you said, okay kids, we're going to have a K-pop test today. They were like, yay! But little do they know, it stands for Keep practicing outdated pronunciation. <laughs> so if they say something like orange juice, perfect, 100%. What if we did the star test? That sounds fun. That sounds like a good place to start, the star test. Kind of ties in with a bit of textbook memorization that you guys are probably doing a bit of these days. But if you tell your co-teacher we're going to do the star test, sit there and recite textbook. <laughs> acronym itself is a lot better than, than what it sounds like. How about the FTA test? <clears throat> I guarantee you that if any of your students, really 100%, I guarantee you, if any of your students in any of your classes, if they were to take this test, they would all get 100%. Any idea what it stands for? Because this, the question is, hi, how are you? <laughs> and it's the fine thank you on your test. I'm pretty sure all of your students will yeah. pass with five colors. And on that note, I would like to say thank you all and open up the floor for that.